My name is Pente Conerva. I'm sort of an affiliate member of the Redwood Neuroscience or the, or the Redwood Center. Uh, I was there when the Redwood Neuroscience Institute was f founded, and so. But, but my affiliation with Bruno goes way back to the time when he was a master's student at, at Stanford, and then we worked at uh, NASA Ames for, for a little while. After which he went to ca ca um, Caltech, and, and you probably know more of what happened since then, or anyway, what he has studied since then and taught too. Anyway, uh, my topic for the today is the computer and the brain. And that's an interest, a very long in, uh, term interest of mine. I'd say from, from the first time I learned about computers, I heard them compared to brains. And, and, and that has been sort of a fascinating thing to me ever since. So I will talk, this is here sort of an outline, uh, about John von Neumann and then what he accomplished. I mean, he accomplished a lot, but I'll just touch a couple of things. And then um, attempts to understand brains in computer terms in artificial intelligence and artificial neural networks. And then I'll go and talk about high-dimensional high spaces and some of their special properties that uh, I feel give hope of our actually eventually understanding how brains compute. And, and then there's some examples how we can arrive at meaning from context using high dimensional uh, space properties of high dimensional spaces, how we can encode time sequences and structure. Uh, and also that if it, with um, neural hardware we can actually implement something that resembles a, a one of the most important elements in our ordinary computer, which is the random access memory. So it's possible to build from neural hardware a random access memory that works, works with high dimensional representations. And I have two puzzles, so I just want you to look at these, and they are just, we just will eventually try to find letters to, to fill those, those blanks. So that's this, this sort of a, leave it in the background. Okay, John von Neumann, uh, he's a Hungarian mathematician uh, who actually uh, did a lot of work in many, many areas. If you go into, into Wikipedia and look at John von Neumann, I think he has contributed to several dozen areas in mathematics. One of them being, of course, then computing. He is attributed to the idea of a, a stored program computer where the, where the program actually resides as data in, in memory. And that's known as the von Neumann architecture. And it is really powerful concept and, and, and it makes possible your laptops and, and your cell phones and, and probably everything, everything that, that um, all our lives are touched, touched by what this, this von Neumann architecture in, in, the, in the form of computers of various kinds. Also, there's been powerful hype. It, we've been, it's been called electronic brains from the very early on in, in 1949. Edmund Berkeley wrote a book, Giant Brains or Machines That Think. Uh, it's, I don't think this Berkeley has anything to do with Berkeley here, but, but anyway, that's Berkeley of 1949. Um, but however, it's, it's uh, the, the behavior that our traditional computers um, produce is it's very different from what brains produce. And this already puzzled John von Neumann. And in 1958, came out, posthumously came out a book by him called The Computer and the Brain. It was lecture notes that he was preparing, preparing toward the end of his, end of his life. And... Um, now, this, this book, Computer and the Brain, is already available in second edition, published in 2000. I think it's, if you are interested in, in, in a topic, I think it's highly recommended <coughs> reading. Anybody familiar with the John von Neumann's Computer and the Brain? Have you read it? Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Sure. Would you recommend? Yeah, it was, it was interesting. It's 
very short. It's it's, it's very short, and and what I like in it that a mathematician actually starts looking at you know what's going on here because because the the architecture that he had proposed, the von Neumann architecture, did not produce the kind of behavior that brains do. So, so it's, it's, I think it's still very, very current, worth reading. There have been two complementary approaches to sort of trying to figure out how computers could be made to behave or produce behavior, the kind of brains... Uh, produce artificial intelligence uh, which relies on explicit programming and so the words of logic and and lisp are sort of they're also synonymous with traditional ai i would say and there's the artificial neural networks uh, and it goes by several names pretty much the same idea artificial neural networks parallel distributed processing Connectionism. It's terms that are used by different communities. Engineers like artificial neural nets, and engineers and physicists, parallel distributed processing, I would say cognitive scientists and psychologists probably use connectionism. And the important thing here is that the learning is implicit from data. So here are sort of statistics and backpropagation is my shorthand for radiant descent, various various iterative methods that that find uh, uh, are important in the learning. So one relies on learn, uh, logic and other relies on statistics. So these are two complementary approaches. And then I think there needs to be a third one because neither one, either one, of, neither one of those two has yet produced the, the, the result we are looking after. Um, and we should take more of our cues from how brains actually are constructed and maybe even how they work as far as we know. And one of the things that really stands out when you, when you get in this area, the, the brain circuits are extremely large. So there are thousands, a single circuit can have thousands or millions or even billions of neurons. So just with this idea, we can already start get, doing some, getting forward, doing going forward, and because this kind of, the, the size of the circuit suggests that we should be computing with very wide words, something like we should compute with 10,000 bit wide words, which is traditional computers, you have 8, 16, 32, 64. So there's, 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 there's actually no difference between 64 and 10,000. And so maybe computing with 10,000 bit words actually gives us something that that could be more like brain-like computing. And this, of course, uh, from a mathematical point of view, uh, invites us to look at properties of high-dimensional spaces. And so, um, and th the interesting thing is that these properties can be demonstrated even with binary spaces where the di individual dimensions are binary. And, and so that's, that is the easy, simplest example that there is, and it already is sufficient, that the kind of space is sufficient to demonstrate what we're interested in. So we think of, I mean, if 10,000 bit binary vectors, think of all the points of this space, or all the 10,000 dimensional binary vectors, or 10,000 bit words. I, I sort of use synonymously word point, vector, and word. Who put that comma there? It doesn't belong there. <laughs> no, it can. Okay, so here's an example. Uh, example of a 10,000-bit word or 10,000-dimensional vector or point of a 10,000-dimensional space. And this, mathematically, this kind of space is, uh, can be thought of as the corners of a 10,000-dimensional 10, unit cube. And here, instead of 10,000, I just demonstrating with three-dimensional unit cube, and, and that's drawn in two dimensions. Uh, so zero, 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 then you, you, you have the various corners of the cube, well, and it will be um, addressed by the various um, bit patterns. In this space, distance between two points two binary words or vectors uh, 
is easily expressed as the number of places at which those vectors differ. It's called the Hamming distance, or it's also called the L1 norm, and it is a shortest path along the edges of, of the cube. So if you look back here, the distance from this point to this point, they differ in, in, in three bits, and if you go along the cube, this one, if you, the shortest path, so they, in three steps you get there, of course, they're more than one way of getting there in, in three steps. So that, that's a demonstration of how, how the distance works in this space. Another interesting thing is that it's a very this particular space is very symmetrical. All points in this space are equivalent to all other points. It's just like if you take a cube, no corner or vertex of the cube is is different geometrically from any of the others, other than it's just labeled with a different number. But you, so, and, and this, this, holds, this holds true in, when, you, when you go in high dimensions, 10,000. It doesn't matter what the number of dimensions is. So, so there's, in this space, there's no concentration anywhere. Because if there was a concentration, there would be some point that would be somehow different than, than all the other. Whereas all these are equivalent in terms of terms of where the other points are lying. But then this interesting thing, very interesting thing is that in terms of volume of the space or mass of the number of points in the space or distance from any one point to the rest of the points, it looks like it is very highly concentrated. And, and, and this, is, this is significant, this is absolutely important. And here I will show a little bit of the concentration uh, to show how the points are distributed, we, we first realized that the distribution can, it's, it's, it's a binomial, distrib probability distribution binomial. Since there are 10,000 different uh, coordinates, 10,000 10, bits, the mean in this space is 5,000, and the standard deviation, it happens to be in a binomial dis distribution, is the Standard deviation is 50, and if we sort of talk in, nor in terms of normalized quantities, where where the, uh, the distance is from zero to one, then the mean is half, and the standard deviation is 0 0.005. And here is sort of a rough picture of that. I have two binomial distributions in this. One binomial distribution where the n is 15, just to show how binomial works. And another binomial distribution where n is 10,000. And here's the 15, it, you know, and here's sort of zero, meaning zero bits, and, and here the distance one in, in, the, in the 15 case, so the distance between two points in the space would be, the Hamming distance would be 15 bits. So, so here, uh, with 15, so you, the probability is very low, and then it, peaks in the middle and, and then a symmetric distribution and that one already looks a lot like normal distribution although it's a discrete distribution and, 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 and an interesting thing is that the binomial or the normal distribution is a very good approximation of the binomial once the number gets to something like 15. Certainly by the time the number is 10,000 we, we are dealing with the, you can you can get all uh, all the probabilities using a normal approximation. So here here is sort of a picture of normal. It's just the probability is like nothing happens, and then everything happens all at once. In other words, if you if you start from some point in a space, you can you can go almost half away to this point, point forty seven, before any of the space or much of the space is included. That's a, that's a billionth of the space. Then in this range of 0.6 out of 1, all, all the, the points are concentrated and at, the, at, that, at that distance. Remember now, in terms of distance, they are concentrated. In terms of actually space, they are not concentrated anywhere I mean, because the space looks the same from any, any point. It looks the same. So this, this discrepancy, the discrepancy between 
the probability in terms of distance and and uh, uh, the, the, the probability of finding any of the points or many of the points at a certain distance being so highly concentrated is is one of the most important things about high dimensional spaces that that sort of makes them interesting thing to look. There are other things, but I think this is the first I'd say the first the first thing to to keep keep in mind and take from this talk if if nothing else. <laughs> uh, so if you if you compare two vectors and if if they are diff if they differ like in forty percent of the points, they still can be considered similar because there aren't many other points in this space. And it's only when they differ in about fifty percent of the around fifty percent uh, you could say that they are dissimilar or uncorrelated. So more of the properties, okay, just the summar, summarizing here, the distance of point 47 from any point covers a mere billionth of the space by volume, and by volume I mean a number of points, total number of points in the space. Total, I, I guess I never actually quoted what the total number, if you have 10,000 dimensions, the total number of points is 2 to 10,000. So out of two to those, out of two to ten thousand, uh, only billionth of those will be covered. And you have point forty-seven, and you at point five, then half the space, and then point fifty-three, almost almost all the space is covered. And this, in terms of some practical things, means that uh, this kind of representation is very robust. Ten thousand bit vectors can tolerate a lot of noise and and still identify it with if you think of some particular vector being the correct one uh, then it can still be identified with the correct vector so like 4500 4, bits is still very close or similar 5000 5, bits is very far or dissimilar there's another important property that I I, I will not really be using much in this in this talk, but it is that a sum vector, if you take a sum of k random vectors, k being some small number like, or even 100, uh, then, it, oh, and then you, you take, te you take like 100 random vectors, and then you add them together or superpo superimpose, this sum vector is similar to the vectors that go in, into the sum. And in this case, the similarity would not be uh, measured by Hamming distance, but it could be measured by cosine or correlation. Um, so superposition produces vectors that, that are similar to what goes into the soup, as it were. Now, if, if percepts like what we see or what we hear, if they are represented by points of a high dimensional space, and this is sort of the idea that things are represented in this space, points of the space, uh, the, the same object is never perceived the same way. When you see the face twice, you never see it exactly the same. If you see the same over, over a period of time, it can be quite different. Hear the voice twice. You know, it's not the same. Yet, you can identify the same as being the same face you saw before, the same voice heard, heard before. And that is part of the things that you get from high dimensional representation. It, it tolerates variation. Um, and And... This certainly is true in in all higher forms of of, of uh, um, an animal life. Uh, we recognize things without them ever being exactly the same on two occasions. Okay, so, could you go back to the previous slide? I just have a quick question. So that at the bottom we say the sum vector superposition. Mm -hmm. so does that require there to be a um, few bits? Percentage-wise, set on each in each vector, they have to be sparse. Uh, it can be sparse. It can be. It's the important thing that they're random. 
random independent random and and what this means technically is that some sort of randomization or whitening uh, may be needed to take advantage of this property. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that the Hamming distance that uh, you couldn't measure how similar they were with the Hamming distance. Is that because oh, because the sum because Hamming distance is a, you 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 can you can compare with Hamming distance to binary vectors, mm -hmm. but in this case. In this case, a sum, and, and so one of them is binary, the other is. You can also compare binary vectors with cosine or correlation, mm -hmm. uh, and, and what I'm saying is still true. <laughs> yeah, but that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, I, I, to I, I talk a little loosely in terms of similarity, and sometimes a similarity can be two, two vectors can be measured with Hamming distance. Sometimes you need something like cosine because they're no longer binary vectors. But basically it says that there's some measure of distance in the space and within that, with that measure notion of distance, the things are close to each other or they are far from each other. Okay, so here in the previous one I talked about percepts being represented by points of a, of a uh, high dimensional space. Now here Concepts can also be represented by points of a high dimensional space. And, and so let's, let's look at what, um, what, what would be significant in that case. Okay, first of all, mind, minds work with concepts. I mean, we work with words, we work with percepts, but we, work, we also have a concept for things. And, and that certainly is, is uh, one of the signs of in intelligence in humans that we can form concepts and, and, and we can work with this, this concept. We do not have to have uh, physical objects. We can deal with, with things conceptually. And we have words for concepts. And here are some like this red apple and this concept of a red apple, a lake. Is a con uh, and, and concept can re represent a word or it can represent a combination of words, a, fra a phrase that, that um, can sort of a concept of a star story, concept of a, of a, uh, a mystery story. I mean, it, it, mystery stories are very different from nature stories. I mean, they can combine elements, but still, when you hear something like mystery story, you know, you you know whether you want to read it at night or not. You know. <laughs> If you, if you uh, are disturbed in your sleep uh, by unresolved things, um, okay. If, if we model concept with space, then we want to have something like concept that are similar to each other should have uh, be represented by uh, points in a space that are close to each other or vectors that are are, are similar, and so. Uh, the vectors, uh, bit patterns for red and yellow should be close to each other in a space. Um, and whereas something like truth and red apple, which to us don't seem to really have much in common, they should be far away in space. And, and we'll see if, if this kind of thing can somehow naturally be produce these kinds of concept vectors. So I will s go through uh, an example of producing semantic vectors uh, that are learned by uh, going through data. That will come in a, in a, in a little while. Um, another thing about high dimensional space is that intermediate point is, yeah, I've been, I started emphasizing it that when you start from any single point and you go, you have to go very far before many of the other points actually are, in, or the space are included. But there still are lots, I mean, if, if you have two to 10,000 points all together, there still are lots of points <laughs> overall. And, and between any two points that, sort of are uncorrelated or unrelated, 
there are actually many points that are very highly correlated with each, each of the two. And that's again somewhat counterintuitive because it doesn't happen in two and three dimensional space. In high dimensional space, you find two things that are unrelated from zero to point five. And there are lots of points that are point 25 from each of those. And point 25 is very close in terms of probability or, or the volume of space that is covered by. And so, so this should be reflected in terms of concepts so that you can relate two unrelated concepts by other concepts that are close to each other. And here are a couple of chains that I, I am demonstrating. I'm trying to find a bridge from man and lake. And you, so, so you probably would say that the, the concept of man and the concept of lake are very different from each other. To me, they are. But the concept of man to fisherman is not a big gap. I mean, nor from fisherman to fish is there a big gap, nor from fish to lake. So it, with two intermediate concepts that are very close in both, in both directions, I have related two totally sort of unrelated concepts. Here's another chain, man and plumber. Of course, this may be a little bit sexist because the plumber could also be a woman. <laughs> but then from plumber and water, those, you could sort of, you can imagine plumber and water sort of being, being close concepts, and water and lake. And so we have, we have two different chains of concepts that relate unrelated concepts and if we look at intermediaries that, that are sort of significantly re, uh, um, related in the chains, the in, intermediaries need not be related, like we are plumber and fish. I take one from one from one and one on the other. And okay, and this again is just like points in the very high dimensional space. You can, you can, you can. Uh, get from one point to an unrelated point in many ways and in such, such a way that those, those ways are, again, unrelated to each other. The intermediate points are unrelated. So this is a, this is a very nice, nice example of how intuitively concepts work and then how they then might be reasonably mapped into points of high-dimensional space or high-dimensional high vectors. Okay, so now the next example is, is producing concept vectors from data. In one of my early slides, I said that in, in, in artificial neural networks or connectionism, the thing was that we learn implicitly from data. And this would actually qualifies, qualifies as, an, as an example of such. Um, Okay, so here vectors that represent meaning, we just call them semantic vectors. And they, they are good semantic vectors if they have this property that if the meanings are similar, then, then the vectors are similar. They are close in the space. If the meanings are dissimilar, then the vectors would be dis, dis, dissimilar. And we have also said that, seen that uh, concepts can be, uh, I mean, labeled by words. I mean, the words related to concept. And so now we're going to go through a, through a little exercise where we form semantic vectors for words by reading a lot of text. So the data, the text, and 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 the, and the words are the ones that label context and so so <clears throat> words themselves do not have this property but the concepts have this property of of, of of closeness and distance and the words don't because you can have the same word in different languages labeling the same concept um, the way yeah did you have a question yeah. 
any conception of, of what is sort of the lower bound of the length of these vectors that you still might get the beneficial properties? Uh, you, I would say it should be over 1,000. Mm -hmm. And if you have, if, it depends, it depends on, on the size of data also. But, but if you want to get realistic, I mean, small toy examples could be done with several hundred, 300 maybe. If you, if you have fewer concepts. Yeah, but if you, if you want to get a situation where you actually never run out, I mean, no, you'll never, not, not never, in a lifetime you won't run out, then you may need something like 10,000. And, and the thing is that it's sort of, the capacity, in some sense, it grows exponentially with the, with the, with the dimensionality of the vector. Uh, and so to, to cover twice the lifetime, you do not have to have vectors that are twice as long. To cover the experience of twice the lifetime, you do not need vectors that are twice as long. So that's, that's, uh, uh, that's actually a very uh, good thing about these rep high dimensional representations. You have to go high, but then there's the point where it's high enough. And I've, I've used 10,000. Um, as an example, because um, it actually gives a lot of capacity for any of the systems built on these principles. And also our computers these days can handle 10,000. Maybe 30 years ago, 1,000 bits would have been used in examples because computers were not, not that big and you couldn't run experiments with, with bigger... <clears throat> okay, so we will... Um, use the context of the words to encode, try to encode or capture the semantics or the meaning. And, and, and so we also therefore use the word context vector, semantic vector and context vector uh, in, in this context. They are the same, same thing. Um, okay, so random indexing. To explain how it works, we have to sort of get some of the basic vocabulary, well, basic ideas. And one idea is that we have a vocabulary. We have a set of all the different words that occur in the text. And this could be even, even be so dumb that you just, anything that is a consecutive set of letters is considered a word. And so plural and singular forms would be different words. And these kinds of things have been used in, in, a very, in a very, I'd say, promiscuous way. You can also do pre-analysis and get the basic forms of the words, in, I mean, the word stems, so basic forms, and you just get somewhat better results. Okay, so there's the vocabulary, and that's a set of words that, that occur in a text. And each of those words... I mean, if you, if you do no reprocessing, then you could have like 50,000 words, different letter strings. Uh, and if you limit and to legitimate English words, let's say you may have 10,000 words in your, in your text. The thing is that it doesn't matter if, if you, and you increase text, you encounter new words, the methods still work. Okay, so each of these words, each of these uh, fifty, hundred, each of these hundred thousand words, okay, <laughs> will be represented by two vectors. One of them is called the random index vector, and the other is called the semantic vector. And it's the semantic vector or the context vector is the one that we are after. And so we have it only after the process. Whereas the random index vector, once we encounter a word. We just give it a random bit of strings, and it, it's its representation from then on forever. Just like when you learn your English or whatever your native language is, once you are given a word, you use that particular word from then on. Its meaning may change over time because you encounter the word in more contexts. But still, the word itself is the same. Well, this is... So, sort of like the random index vector, you know. You encounter a word, you just, you just 
write it in this random index way, as it were. You just have a second way of writing it. And so they are fixed from the start, and they are co uncorrelated with each other. And this is another property of high-dimensional space. If you take randomly a point of the space, two points of the space, they are pretty much uncorrelated, unrelated. That comes from that very, very uh, high peak distribution that, that I had on early on. <clears throat> okay, so, so these are the random index vectors and then the semantic vectors. They are learned by going through the data, the text. And the way we go through the text, this is the total algorithm is, is, is here. Uh, we have, we could have like 10 million words or 100 million words, a billion words of text. And each word in the text in, in turn becomes the focus word. And the surrounding text, a few words before and after, become the context window. And here's my example, the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog's back. So we have the focus word has gone here, then it was here, here, here. And right now, this is the focus word. So a few words, the three here before and the three after, are now it's context window. So that is the context of over. And here's how the algorithm goes. I mean, um, all the semantic vectors to start with, they just set into the zero vector, 10,000 10, zeros. We step through the text one word at a time. And so here, now we were at over. And then we up update the semantic vector for that word, over, by uh, adding to its semantic vector, or the context vector, the random index words for these words occurring in the context. So the semantic vector for over will be now modified by adding the random index vector for brown, random index for fox, random mix index for, for jumped, random index V, random for lazy. So that, that particular sum has been, for over now, has been, uh, uh, to, to that uh, has been added uh, six more vectors. Yeah. And maybe more linked with V than those other words too, right? Because you jump over mm. something usually. And um, yeah. is there, so is the thought that as you sort of repeatedly encounter over, you might repeatedly encounter jump and V? And then these that's words, true. That's, 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 how, that's how the statistics get incorporated. So that, so that if, if jump occurs in the context of over many times, then the random index vector, the RI vector, that one that never changes, it will be added into over many times and so it will dominate in the sum, in the, in, in the resulting context of semantic vector. Is it also yeah. reasonable to think that the closer you are to the word, you might be more related, so you can wait? That, that that, okay, this is a basic idea. Then you can embellish it. You can embellish it by, by waiting with distance or waiting or somehow taking into account that the word was before, after. And if you take into account before and after, then you <coughs> encode some of the grammatical structure of language, but certainly in English, which the word order is very important. And, and all of those things are possible. This is just... So, you, yeah. so, so this is all there is to it, except that if you, have, if, you have, if you have 10 million words of text, you have to go through this 10 million times. And at the end, you get a semantic vector for each of the words in your vocabulary. If you use cosine as the mesa similarity of vectors, because now they, they are some, some vectors. They are no longer, these are not binary. Uh, but so words with similar meaning will acquire similar semantic vectors. The yellow and, and the green will be similar. And, and a man in a lake will, will be dissimilar. I mean, this is just, this, the statistics uh, uh, are reflected in, in, 
the statistics in the in the data in 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 the, in the various contexts are reflected in this way in the in the resulting semantic vectors. And here also notice that learning is incremental. What's called online learning, which means if you have uh, have now you have gone through your hundred million words of text. If you add m new text, uh, you just keep adding. If if a new word occurs in the vocabulary, you just you just produce a new random random index vector for that word, and 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 nothing, you know, nothing changes in what was done before. And so it, so it can handle large and ever-growing vocabularies. And in some sense, and this is, this is interesting to me, is, uh, is it, this, in some, way, some, some sense it sort of corresponds to how we come to understand the meanings of words implicitly. I mean, you can go in a dictionary and look at the meaning of the word, but it's a majority of the words that you use in everyday life, you've learned by just hearing them and seeing them. And, and so, so this implicit learning here, I think it's, a, it's, it's something, something to be appreciated as a model of how, how meaning can be captured from examples. There's a sort of a phrase that words become known by the company they keep. There's another thing that I will not go into any any further in here. Yeah. Um, how much are you limiting yourself by only taking three words on either side? How what does it affect the results if you choose two or eight on either side? All, um, th all those kinds of things are possible in, in certain tests that we... I mean, people have, have, have done this kind of research. And in a certain test, like synonym test, it, it has proved that very narrow context window gives the best result. But, but the, another way of con considering a context is that a whole document being a context. And, and so, so this particular basic idea can be used in many, many different, different ways. And... The waiting is possible. Wider windows is possible. Of course, you know, window width is also <laughs> could be considered wet waiting. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I was just going to ask: Are these uh, uh, similarities or semantic vectors similar to what you would expect if you were to uh, use the thesaurus as, as your data set? Um, so, do they group similarly to how synonyms group? Or are they different types of semantic vectors? Um, okay, uh, I'm not sure I... I can tell what kind of tests have been done. And these kinds of semantic vectors, they, they have been used in, in what's called the test of English as a foreign language. And it's a synonym test. And, and a synonym test, you know, you, you're given... A word, and then you have four alternatives as possible synonyms, and then you pick the one that's most likely. And people taking that test, for, I mean, foreigners coming studying in the United States have to take that test. Uh, this, if you use the, the semantic vectors and the correlations between the semantic vectors as a criterion of choosing the best, you get about the same level of performance as, as, as students, foreign students taking the test. Uh, of course, it all depends on what kind of data, what kind of text was used in, in forming the semantic vectors. But you can, you can mix, you can mix data about nature. You can mix data about finance, and the word "bank" can be a cloud bank, or it can be a bank that is. It doesn't matter because the semantic vector for bank because of high dimension, it can be close to weather and it can also be close to finance. In high dimensions, this is possible. Yeah. Is there some kind of um, renormalization that's done? Because when you're adding in vectors to the semantic vectors, it sounds like that's good arbitrarily about uh, it. When that happens, the best way to compare them is with cosine, 
which automatic normalizes. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, what happens with words that are sort of, like if you were looking at this sort of window, would be similar to everything, like the... Okay, now linguists, I have this, given this just in a very rough form. When linguists do this, they notice that these actually do not, they call, I think, call function words. If they do not add, they actually subtract and distract. So they actually, a very frequent words, they become what they call as, 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 as stop words. In other words, they are left out of the text. It's, it's, it's not a satisfactory solution conceptually, but that's how dominant meaning, sort of words that do not actually tell about context, but more tell of the grammatical structure. They, if, if, if you use this very simple algorithm I showed, then the very frequent words like in all of the, they just are not counted at all. They, it, they so, left out. like, if you didn't, let's say you didn't know, like, yeah. which were the common words, and yeah. you just starting to learn language, then yeah. you'd presumably, like, want to include everything? Then and I would say, I think, I, think that's, that's, I think that's how the game should be played. But then you should ha- you should probably have some sort of counters there that after you, after you have encountered a certain word too many times and decide that then it no longer gets weight. So, so, so that's, I think that's, uh, that's, that's the way the game should be played. You're right. And, and it, because initially you don't know anything. Yeah, right. It seems like also those words that are encountered Mm. Next to many, many different words yeah. will become sort of unsparse, like other words yeah. would not become, right? So you could sort of have a threshold that says, you know, yeah. you've got too many bits filled on this thing. Yeah, you, yeah, you, you, because, yeah, that, 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 those are all practical considerations when these things are made into actually working systems. These kind of things are made into working systems. I mean, something like this, I and mean, Google uses, I, I think Google, at least in the experimental search, they use this. Relate, things related to related to this. Uh, okay, yeah, this was this was the problem we're going to get. People have to leave. I was told people have to leave for other classes at ten thirty. I plan to use the time if you don't mind. <laughs> Talk a little bit about sequences uh, and sequences. Okay, you want to be able to represent in these high-dimensional vectors a sequence of vectors that, as a, sing, as a single vector, uh, so that you always deal with things that are in your ten thousand dimensional space. And and the idea there is that you have to have a single item or a sequence of items uh, represented in the same 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 dimensional space. And um, how you can do it is, is a sort of an example of a simple recursive, a recur, recur, recurrent net. Uh, and, and, and so here's my, here's my t- case. I have a sequence. So each, each one of these could be considered a 10,000-bit pattern. And we want to encode the sequence that A is followed by B, followed by C, followed by D, so forth. And so first come A, and so there's nothing, nothing. So you just, it's, it's, okay, when the, when the next element comes, what we want to do, we want to transform the first element and then add to it. And, and, and the simple, simplest cons- transformation here would be just a permutation. You just take some random, ra- uh, random uh, reordering of the, of the bits and... In, in, in the, and permutation, if, if, if you're in the linear al- algebra, permutation can be con- conceived as a, as a multiplication by matrix. So you could think of this as a uh, matrix, permutation matrix P times the vector A. And then C comes along, so we permute whatever has been seen before, and then we add C. And then D comes along, so we permute what we 
what we have seen before, we permute that and then we add. Now, I've said earlier that a sum is similar to each of the components and when do sum. It turns out, okay, first of all, let's see how it breaks down. Permutation has the nice property that it distributes over addition. So, so when we take the representation of A, B and permute it, then the permutation, it's, it works as if the B were permuted once and the A were permuted twice. And in this one, the A is now distance three away, so it's been permuted three times, two times. In mathematics, we call it, we call it the permutation distributes over addition uh, vectors. Um, and, of course, this three times shuffling this in the same way, it's, it still is just another permutation. It's just a different permutation. Um, and what happens is that these different permutations keep track of how far back something happened. Now, so at this point, when all, all of these four have been encountered, then this sum vector is it's similar to D. It is similar to C that has been shuffled once. It is similar to B that has been shuffled twice, similar to A that has been shuffled three times. It's similar to all of these. But because of that, it's possible to recover what happened a certain number of steps away. Two steps away, because permutation, it's a, it has an inverse operation. It's a count. You, can, you can shuffle back. In, uh, and here, here, I'm representing it with this Q, matrix Q, which is, which is the inverse of P. If you want to go back two steps back, so we could... Uh, uh, the permutation matrix Q times Q into AB's representation of ABC, and here again the, the two Qs um, distribute into the sum, and those two Qs are there. There's the, those two P, Q and P cancel each other, but here because there are two and they cancel, so we end up with the vector that's A plus once permuted B and twice permuted C, but these can be considered as noise, and so A is the only one that that is sort of part of the original set of, of vectors, and it is close enough to be the, um, the result A prime is close enough to the actual A that, uh, that it, it can be. Uh, recover it if, 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 if you have certain other machinery available in your system. And so that's just a sim simple example of a, of a recurrent net. Okay, so then that is one kind of composition, but more general composition is also possible using these high dimensional vectors. Um, okay, if, it turned out, if you go in the back, back history of early neural nets and connectionism models, the early models suffered what was known as the binding problem. I, I don't know if you discussed the binding problem in your class, but the binding problem is that basically it was this, that these kinds of compositions that were used in the early models, the representation, the vector that represents yellow banana and red apple, it would end up being the same as red banana and yellow apple. In other words, things could not the representation could not keep apart these, these two quite different things. They would have the same representation. So that was known, going to refer to as the binding problem. And in an ordinary computer practice, we avoid binding problem by using records with fields. And so the programmer keeps track of the nature and the location of the fields. Uh, and another important thing is that the record can include pointers to other records. And that made possible uh, compositional structure in, uh, in, in traditional programming. This is, this, is, um, uh, this was sort of the strong point, an interesting point in early AI is that they could, they could with with ordinary uh, uh, programming structures, they could 
they could represent constructs that appear in language and databases of all kinds. And so you had the programming language list, which is really programming with pointers, if, 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 if you like to describe it in, in very few words. And, but there is also a distributed solution to the binding problem, and it's using two compositional operators. The, 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 the binding problem comes from the f from fact that y you use only one compositional operator, you superposition. But if you have two operators, one is sort of like multiplication that you use binding, and add on other superposition or addition that's used for chunking, you actually will avoid the binding problem. And here, let's see, traditional... So traditionally, if you have if you have representing certain variable having value, you have these three. Then you have for each variable you have certain number of bits in your record, and then you put the values in those slots. Whereas the distributed representation means that the ten thousand bits, every one, every one of them contains some information of the over the whole whole thing. And how how, how is it possible? And here's, here's how we can, we can actually do it. Uh, if you have, for x and a, they, if they are represented by high dimensional vectors, binary vectors, then they can be bound using another other operator. It's the exclusive or, which is, if the, if the two are the same, you get zero. If the two are different, you get one. So one and zero are different, you get one. Zero, zero, the same, zero. One, one, same, zero. So, the variable x is bound to a or, uh, by using using this exclusive or operator. As mathematics is also addition modulo two. Same b is y. You take you have some representation of y and b. Then b equals y would be represented by by that. And and sa same for z variable z has value c. And then you sum them together. You get the sum, and then you threshold at half the number of things that went into it. Then you get a representation H that represents this entire record. And, and represents in, in several ways. One thing is that if, if you change any of those, I mean, maybe go, if, you, if you change, like, if you put x is equals b and y equals a, you would get a different record. So if, you, if you're suffering from the binding problem, then you get the same record, but here you do not suffer from the binding problem. So in, in that sense, it encodes, but there's another sense in which you can actually find out what went into that. That's the h, that's from the bottom of the previous slide. And then we want to see what the value of x was in that, in that uh, some vector, and then that can be done again using the same, in this, in this case, using the same multiply operator, the exclusive or. So, so this is the um, sum of the three, and then you exclusive or, then you get another vector. And it turns out that this one is similar to, okay, we want to know what's the value of x in h. And this operation gives us an, as a vector that's not exactly a, that's the right answer, but, but gets a, a prime that is similar to a. And what we need in this kind of system is one more thing, and that is what's called an item memory or cleanup memory. And it finds the nearest neighbor among all known vectors. So if you look at here, when you do something like this, these x, a, y, b, z, C, they will be all sort of known vectors and they have to be stored in the cleanup memory. And then you, you, you go and can do a nearest neighbor search and then that will produce, produce A. And the interesting thing is that, is that that kind of, okay, well, here's, I'm going to skip these two. It just, it just gives symbols for, 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 for okay, the interesting thing is that in, in, in actual neural hardware, or actually wetware, what we want to call it, we 
as we, can, we can construct a memory that works as a random access memory. So, so, so this would be, we would like to have some sort of neural random access memory that finds the nearest neighbor. And it's as, actually possible to build a random access memory for 10,000 bit white words. And it works very much like your ordinary computer random ac access memory. You, uh, you, you can address, you have an address and you can, you can, you can probe the memory, cue the memory with an address, and you get what is stored in that address. Because things are slightly different here because now the addresses are 10,000 bit addresses and you will never build a memory that has two to 10,000 memory locations. If you have 16 bits of address, you can, you can build a memory with two to 16 locations. If 32, I think you can probably, these days you can, you have 64 bits of memory. It's address, you will, anyway, 10,000 bits of address requires some somewhat different solution from the ordinary, what we do in ordinary random access memory. Okay, we still want to address the memory with 10,000 bit words. And, and we also want to use those as data in the memory. Now, in this case, each ad address has to activate several memory locations. Yes, there are still memory locations, but they're not 2 to 10,000. There's some, some sample of those 2 to 10,000. And then data are stored, and they are retrieved from the activated location. So you have you sort of sparse activation of the actual locations that are in your built in, in your memory, and then you distribute the data among those locations. Uh, and... This will have the property that you can then use approximate address and still retrieve the data that you stored. Yes? It seems like the properties that you talked about um, in the beginning yeah. were using the entire hypercube um, of available space. Yes. If you constrain it to being sparse and you concentrate your um, vectors to be closer to zero, to all zeros, um, do those properties remain? I th 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 this, this, this story still holds... What I'm telling now still holds on when you just take a random sample of all the things, not, not just near, near the zero. Or, well, some different story can be told, and it still works, if you limit your number, your, your vectors that you deal with, something like 10% ones and 90% zeros. But then you, have, then you have a slightly different space. But this kind, this kinds of things... Most, most of these things are just very, very trivially. The thing that is hard in that kind of case is getting the binding, binding operator that I, uh, the exclusive or, several of the, this, this binding with exclusive or. For that to work nicely, you need, but that's, that's, that's a research topic for, 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 yeah. Um, but the thing is that this kind of memory, it, it, it can be probed with approximate cues and it produces something that was stored before. It may require several iterations. And the curious thing is that the wiring diagram, if you start looking, if you actually take this seriously and then build a wiring diagram for this memory, it looks an awful lot like the wiring of the cortex of the cerebellum. And this, I think this is amazing. It's, it's coincidence in the sense that it was discovered, it was discovered after, that the correspondence was discovered after the mathematical model was built. And this, this, this realization was first made by David Marr in the late 1960s and James Aldous by about 1970. And I consider it still as one of the one of uh, the most most remarkable remarkable achievements in in terms of, of of comparing real neural structures with some computational mechanism that seems to be needed 
uh, and, and corresponds to something that is essential in, in ordinary computers, which is random access memory. And so, a sort of a uh, final review, I just put some, some milestones or highlights from the path of trying to get from computers, I mean, trying to gap, uh, bridge the gap between computers and brains. There's 1945 is a stored program architecture, the von Neumann, von Neumann architecture. And it's still with us, and it'll be us probably, with us probably 100 years from now. We are not here 100 years from now, but it, it's a... And then this same person then got wondering about this. this there's something more. There's something more that we don't know. And then in his lecture series is published in the book, The Computer and the Brain. Uh, sort of is, is an early realization that, that we have to understand computing also in some different ways. And he did not, he didn't come up with these things that I've talked to you, to you about. But my feeling is that since, since, since lesser people have come up with those ideas, he, he probably <laughs> put it on it had he lived. That's, that's, that's sort of my gut feeling. And as 1970, about 1970, several models of Mar and Albus, which I consider very significant. Mid-80s, the PDP, parallel distributed processing, which is certainly on this line. And um, I put 1991, which is HRI, stands for holographic reduced representation. An example of com com compositional structure in distributed representation is an example of that. And that's 1991, and I, I, th I, I think that is a very important milestone in the way of being able to compute and, or develop computing that that's somehow models how, how brains deal with information. Look at the, look at the 1945, 1991, here we are, 2012, that's a long gap that we have been sort of puzzling with, puzzling with this thing. Um, I, I would expect that in your lifetime, some of these things actually become clear to the point where computer systems are built that are more intelligent in the sense that they learn from their environment and they do not have to be explicitly programmed the way we right now do things. Um, and so here, here's the problem. <laughs> okay, why, why, why did I put this here? That's, we don't know exactly how brains encode information, but we deal with problems in, the, in, 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 in subtle ways, and, and, and the ways really they are they are not available. How we actually solve problems, they are not available. We verbalize things and we think that that's how things happen. No, things happen at, at the low, lower level and the verbalization is just, just to tell the story. And, and psychologists have for a long time, they have actually dealt with very interesting phenomena of how things can be cued and how you... But I think psychologists need models that, that actually then can produce the effects. And some of their models are good, but I think some of our tools that we can bring into that study can be employed in, in these. I don't, I don't have the way of doing it, but I can just... just why don't you raise your hand at the, at the time you know what... what, what, what <laughs> Let's look at first is what this word is. Now I have just shifted it. You know what that is. Okay, good. Well, don't tell. Okay, but we still have another one to solve. And, and for others, this, this is still a mystery. Um, I'll just give another letter. You got it? Good. Yeah. Interesting. Because when I do this one, I think it's just obvious. I mean, any, anybody who has grown up with this language, it's just... It's just it's an inch word. Let's look at the other one. 
that's a little bit that's that's a little bit more difficult. But I I'll, I'll, I'll you can still raise your hand. Okay, what was the, the difficult part was that the inch was introduced as a cue, and it would help, it would sort of make it hard for you to break, do that break. And so these kinds of effects, we really don't, we, we can demonstrate the effects. It would be very interesting to actually find out a mechanism that explain how these things. When I solve crossword puzzles, I'm, I'm very interested in at what point it just pops up. That's, that's, some, that's, some, that's some machinery that's working inside, and we really don't have a good explanation for it, but maybe some of these methods will... Our brainchild will, will answer some of these methods. So, thank you for coming on this rainy day. <laughs> And if you are interested in these kinds of things, you know, I, I'm part of the center and, and uh, I'm always interested in talking with people who, who might, you know, might consider studying more and or doing projects. And, and thank you. <laughs>